Hello, from LPL Financial, welcome to The Talking Point. I'm your host, Quincy Crosby. Good morning, this is Quincy Crosby. It is The Talking Point, and it's August 1st. This is following a strong, strong uh, July. In fact, 56% of the S&P 500 reported, and of that 56%, 73% reported earnings per share above analyst expectations. That's good news. It's very good news. And as we saw, what the market was able to do last week was to say, you know what, the pessimism in the earnings was so palpable that if a company was able to beat that pessimism, even with negative news, uh, you know, the market was able to forgive the, um, the, the negativity. As long also as the companies were able to offer a smidgen of optimistic guidance. And so, for example, what we saw, too, out of Amazon, for example, and Apple, was that Americans are continuing to spend. But it gets more specific than that. And let me go over it. Amazon and Apple both have a market uh, share amongst the middle earners, middle class earners, and upper wage earners. And remember what we heard from Walmart last week. They're, they're coming out and saying, you know what? Folks are coming in and they are spending their money on food. And they're not buying the, uh, you know, the more durable goods or the clothing and so on. So there's a dichotomy in terms of who is spending. And why is spending so important? Because 68 to 70 percent of our economy comes from consumer spending. But it gets even deeper than that. MasterCard actually came out and said that spending was slowing among lower wage earners, but it's still solid among higher wage earners. And why is that so important for us? Because the top 20% of income earners are responsible for about 40% of spending. So we're watching that group and making sure that they are employed because so far, uh, yes, we've heard of a number of office jobs being uh, being reduced, but we want to see if it spreads, if it spreads amongst the higher wage earners and middle income wage earners. They tend to be, tend to be the, what we call the white collar workers, office workers. And so far, yes, there's a glimmer of tech workers being let go, but we want to see if it spreads. And, you know, you get these headlines, uh, company X letting go of 1%, 10%. We want to see which group they're in. Are they in the group that tends to spend the most? The reason for this is you will see an ice age hit if we start to see uh, companies, big companies, laying off uh, their workers. What happens is folks get nervous that they could be next and they stop spending. So far, that has not happened. So this is why we have the labor report this week on Friday. And we will be watching to see who is being hired uh, and we will also be looking on Thursday uh, for the uh, initial claims. So far, by the way, the initial unemployment claims, that sort of stayed steady uh, from last week's numbers. We will be looking at continuing claims because what continuing claims tells us that folks are not getting new jobs. So far, continuing claims has held steady as folks who get let go actually find new jobs almost right away. So these reports are going to be crucial this week. In addition, we want to make sure that wages are not moving higher. We have had three months of report with hourly wages staying the same, and we hope that it stays the same or even moves down. Now, that sounds awful when I say it. I can even hear it in my own voice. Why am I saying this? We're saying it because we don't want those inflationary pressures to rise, because when they do, prices then rise. Keep in mind what companies are trying to do still is raise the prices as the input costs also continue to rise. And for most companies, wages are one of the most important input costs. So that's why we're looking at this in terms of trying to bring inflation down. And that brings me back to the Fed. The Fed, I don't, you know, the market was listening to the Fed and taking out pieces of good news. 
the Fed saying, you know what, we're going to be data dependent before we're not going to come out with, you know, what we're going to do. We're not going to telegraph well in advance what we're going to do. We're going to remain data dependent. And the reason is the next Fed meeting will, will not be next month. And so there will be an awful lot of data releases with regard to inflation, with re regard to earnings, uh, with regard to the employment cost index, you know, in terms of what where our wages headed, and also uh, in just terms of prices uh, uh, across the board. So the Fed has said we will be data dependent. Let me put it real bluntly. So will the market be data dependent. The Fed also said, Chairman Powell did say, that, you know, if they have to raise uh, rates, you know, heftier, they're going to do it. So the market interpreted, though, that the Fed was saying, but we will be easing at some point. Uh, well, that's only if they win the battle against inflation. And so this still remains the core of what the market must be focused on, of what the Fed is going to need to do to bring inflation down to the level that they believe is neutral, which is approximately 2% where it doesn't hurt the economy, where it doesn't help the economy. You heard Chairman of the Federal Reserve, Powell, in his press conference, mention price stability so many times that I actually thought I'm going to start counting how many times he mentioned it. I think the market gets it. He means it. And the Fed does mean it. This week, speaking of the Fed, we will have two speakers. And, uh, you know, I'll pay attention to them. One is uh, James Bullard, who always has something interesting to say. It can be market moving that he is the St. Louis Fed president. And we will also hear from Loretta Mester. She is the Cleveland Fed president. And she also has something always smart and very uh, observant to say. So we'll pay, the market will pay attention to what they have to say. This week, however, we are going to hear from companies, everything from Uber to Caterpillar to Starbucks telling us about consumers, and also Eli Lilly and Amgen. Th these, you know, a broad swath of earnings. However, we're also going to hear some of the ones that I like to listen to. These are the shale oil producers. Why are they important? Because they suffered for so long, and now they are cash rich. And we're going to hear from, I think it's about 28 companies uh, of the shale oil producers. Uh, Devon Diamondback. I want to hear what they have to say about the future. What is their guidance about where they see shale production going? Because we know that it is a subject for the uh, conservationists, for the um, climate change folks, but also for, you know, those who think that they need to keep going and need to keep drilling and exploring because we obviously need to have uh, more oil as we transition to a, a an economy that is more, how shall I say, in line with um, with a cleaner a cleaner energy, you need to have that transition. We see it at the at the pumps. Yes, uh, gasoline prices have come down, but not that much. They're still higher than what we're used to, uh, and the same thing with diesel. So we, I want to hear what they have to say. Uh, they are cash rich. We know that. They're cash rich because they have held off with a tremendous amount of exploration that they typically do and then take out lots of loans. That is not the case now. So we're going to hear from them as well. Also this week, we have a wide swath of other reports coming out. And that is we're going to hear about construction spending. And that is going to be interesting because if you fear that the rates are going to continue to rise and the cost of capital is going to continue to go up, we may see uh, construction spending coming down a bit. But nonetheless, this is going to be an important report, along with the ISM Institute for Supply Management reports. Also, we're going to get um, reports on American debt uh, which is going to be interesting. And I want to mention this because we are seeing that, especially amongst lower wage earners, uh, they are using their credit cards more for paying off, you know, everyday household uh, uh, expenses and also taking money out of their accounts. 
This is one of the reasons that we are looking at what we call M2. We're looking at money supply. M2 is the amount of money in the banks. And when we came off of the uh, COVID, there was an abundance of cash in the systems as Americans saved money, as the government continued with the transfers of money to individuals in this country. That, of course, has stopped. But what we're seeing is that M2 money supply is coming down. It's not coming down, you know, dramatically, but it is coming down, I would say, in a way that's suggesting that, and it works with the lag, by the way, that also inflation coming down. Remember, part of the reason for the absolute push up in inflation was all of the money that came to the system. <clears throat> People wanted to buy things, but there was a problem. There was no supply. So supply and demand out of order. And now we're seeing money supply coming down. In fact, in the fight against inflation, this is very good news. M2 coming down, but remember, it comes down with a lag. Also, this week, we are going to hear about factory orders. And this is, I think, going to be important, too, as it has started to weaken a bit. It's still, we believe, going to be in positive territory, but, but less than what we had last month. Uh, also, let's get down to the payroll. Average hourly earnings, we hope, stay the same. But we are also looking to see if more folks are coming into the workforce. This is important, again, from the inflation standpoint in terms of what we, the, what we have to pay uh, workers. Because the more workers coming into the workforce looking for jobs tells us that employers you know, are not dependent on just a handful of applicants for jobs. So it is going to be scrutinized uh, this week. Also, again, I need to say that the earnings, extremely important. Last but not least, August and September, according to what we call seasonality, are, tend to be dicier months. However, there is a statistic that suggests that when you have a strong July, that uh, August and September actually tend to be better than expected, that they actually do return in terms of the S&P 500 a little bit of an uptick uh, most of the time. Actually, these uh, data uh, go back to 1928, and they do suggest that when you had a very strong July, you could still have an August and September, typically we say, uh, you know, kind of dicey um, in terms of seasonality, but could be stronger. And that actually holds about 58% of the time that we could have a stronger uh, August and, and September. Much depends on what comes out from Washington in terms of the package uh, that the Biden administration is looking at. Much depends on where uh, oil prices go, gasoline prices. Good news here is that the Ukrainians actually have a ship leaving their harbor in a right now, uh, uh, based on an agreement with Russia, uh, although Russia actually bombed uh, one of the ports. I won't go into this in this call, but grain is getting out. Where is it headed? It's headed towards Libya. Uh, Ukraine, the breadbasket of much of Europe, actually produces quite a bit for emerging markets uh, and and. and developing countries where they need it, uh, where the lack of available grain, a lack of available cooking oil actually can lead to tremendous unrest. So the agreement that Ukraine has with Russia is that they will be allowed to get the grain out. We've already seen prices come down for wheat and corn. Take a look at the commodity charts. They are coming down. The prices are now coming down. And that is good news because we need to be able to feed the world uh, and make sure that uh, grain and, and corn are getting to where they need to go. Also, we're seeing the grain har harvest picking up here in the United States so and in Canada. So this is also good news in terms of the prices for food beginning, not, not great, but beginning to inch downward along with gasoline prices. This week also, as I close, we are going to have August 3rd OPEC, OPEC Plus meeting. 
We want to see if they're going to announce that they will be able to pump out more oil. The expectations are that they will say they are not able to do that, that there are supply constraints. So again, an important week across the board for uh, so much. Last but not least, as I say goodbye, I want to thank all of you who came to our breakout session in Denver, all of you whom we met at the research booth. Uh, it was wonderful to see everyone. Thank you so much for working your way over to where we were. Although it did feel like the Arctic, uh, we were still happy to meet everyone with very warm greetings uh, to the research team. Thank you all so much. Have an excellent week. Get in touch. I will be back in touch with you if you um, send me an email. I'll be right back in touch. Thank you so much. This material was prepared by LPL Financial. It's for general information only and is not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. There is no assurance that the views or strategies discussed are suitable for all investors or will yield positive outcomes. Investing involves risks, including possible loss of principal. Any economic forecast set forth in the podcast may not develop as predicted and are subject to change. References to markets, asset classes, and sectors are generally regarding the corresponding market index. All indexes are unmanaged and cannot be invested into directly. Index performance is not indicative of the performance of any investment and do not reflect fees, expenses, or sales charges. All performance reference is historical and is no guarantee of future results. All information referenced in the podcast is believed to be from reliable sources. However, we make no representation as to its completeness or accuracy. Securities and advice Advisory services offered through LPL Financial, a registered investment advisor and broker dealer, member FINRA and SIPC. Insurance products are offered through LPL or its licensed affiliates. To the extent you are receiving investment advice from a separately registered independent investment advisor that is not an LPL affiliate, please note LPL makes no representation with respect to such entity. If your financial professional is located at a bank or credit union, please note that the bank or credit union is not registered as a broker dealer or investment advisor. Registered representatives of LPL may also be employees of the bank or credit union. These products and services are being offered through LPL or its affiliates, which are separate entities from and not affiliates of the bank or credit union. Securities and insurance offered through LPL or its affiliates are not insured by the FDIC or NCUAA or any other government agency, not bank or credit union guarantee not bank or credit union deposits or obligations and may lose value.